Thank you very much, Jay. And thank all of you for the opportunity to talk with you today. I hope to say some things that will be helpful and meaningful to every single one of you. And postvention, that word was coined by Dr. Schneidman to mean a series of planned events to help all concerned after a dire event. And it really has come to mean only after a suicide. You know, we've had students that have died in car accidents, for example, students that died of an extended illness, and a lot of things are done to help them in our schools. However, in particular, this word postvention really is applying to what do we do in the immediate aftermath of a suicide? And the bottom line is we are trying to prevent further suicides and to help everybody with their shock, their grief, their confusion. And you're gonna hear a lot of examples today in terms of experiences that I've had. And we wanna have this to be as interactive as possible. So please use that chat box. And I'm gonna stop at a couple points today during our two hours together. And Sally will give me you know, some of the questions that are in the chat box that are the comments that will be of the most interest to everyone. And I'm pretty sure today that I am not the only person on this webinar that had their life affected by a suicide. I was 25 when my dad shot himself. He was a Marine that didn't really recover from fighting in the South Pacific in World War II. And I'm not really here to talk about him other than to say, I just didn't know what to look for. I didn't know what to do. And looking back on it, he exhibited some pretty clear warning signs. I wish I had just known enough to have asked directly, are you telling me you don't want to live? Are you thinking you're going to kill yourself? Is that it? And at least I would have had the chance to be able to intervene. But if you lost a loved one to suicide, I think I have a pretty good idea of what you've gone through. And I truly believe strongly in prevention. We must approach every suicidal youth with the belief that we can take steps to keep them alive. And you know, 90% of the time, if somebody survives a suicide attempt, they go on to live a long life and they do not die by suicide. So prevention is really important. And I'm so thankful that Jay talked about many important things being done in Nebraska. And I'll only highlight a couple of them quickly. Every kid does need a go-to trusted adult. I've also responded on site to 17 school shootings. What do I really believe about school shootings and, and virtually every youth suicide? They should have been prevented. Kids could always talk to their peers about suicidal and homicidal statements. And I'm well aware of the importance of anonymous reporting, which Nebraska has. And generally, like, what are most of the calls about to the anonymous reporting line? Very often, they're about either being the victim of bullying or they're about somebody being suicidal. So, post-vention. Thank you all for attending, and I hope to clarify a lot of the misconceptions about postvention. I'm going to provide lots of examples that I've been faced with. This is a two-part presentation, and towards the end of the presentation, you'll be provided with some questions to answer on a follow-up questionnaire that will help me guide the activities for next week. And you know, after my dad's suicide, I didn't get involved in suicide prevention at all. In fact, it was seven years later. I was made the director of psychological services for the third biggest district in Texas. And I was only dimly aware that a couple of students had died by suicide because nobody called the psychology department for help. But finally, the superintendent summoned me to his office. And I remember him saying, Scott, what are you going to do about this? I said, I mean, I, I don't really know. We have better figured out. And that was 42 years ago. And it has been my highest priority. What I'm doing today, I've done easily around 2,500 times. 
every state, been there multiple times, 20 different countries. Youth suicide is a worldwide problem. In fact, there was a symposium that identified all of the challenges about youth suicide prevention and focused on schools have to do a lot more. We need to secure guns and make sure they're not readily available to young people. We need to make sure that the media doesn't sensationalize suicide with all the wrong messages. And that symposium was led by somebody you've heard of, Sigmund Freud. The year was 1910. And why would I bring that up today? We haven't progressed enough around the world about preventing youth suicide. And schools can't do it by themselves. They need to partner with the various state resources and local and community agencies. But there's a lot more that we need to do. And I still remember walking into that first classroom one day too late. I mean, my whole career has been a few hours to a day or two too late. I'm always walking into a school in a classroom. The tragedy's already happened. So it's really important that we recognize that good postvention practices, they're actually designed to not only help everyone with all the emotions, but to prevent the next suicide. And by the way, the teacher, it was a high school English teacher. Pretty quickly, she's showing me poems that the suicide victim had left behind. You know, I, I remember one of those poems by heart. It was entitled, A Small Flower. Come and touch me, hold me. Use me for a gift to someone, for anything. Please don't toss me out while my leaves are fresh. If they do turn brown and crinkle, Remember what I was before I faded away. Not the most explicit suicidal poem you've ever heard, but it certainly had a heartache and non-existence. What do you think the English teacher would wish 42 years later? She'd have just sat down with her. Are these your thoughts? It's not the first kid to feel this way. There's help available. I will be there for you every step of the way. And the suicide victim's second poem, I remember how it started. Dear sir or father, don't blame me for not knowing you. I have the picture of you holding me once, but it was the last time and why. When I read of yet another youth suicide, I think primarily of two things, untreated or undertreated mental illness, and very often adverse childhood experiences. Those are all the things we don't want to happen to, to a kid living in poverty, living with a mentally ill or substance abusing parent, being physically amused, abused, sexually abused, emotionally abused, being the victim of bullying, being rejected from a natural parent, death of a parent or a caregiver. Those are the most common adverse experiences. And I wanna to begin today with some statements that have been shared with me over the years. Here was one from a school psychologist. I can't get the principal to even call the parents of a suicide victim, and they're certainly not going to go to the home. I believe strongly when we've learned of the death of a student, we need to get the facts. And we can get those really only from the parents or from the police department. But by going to the home, we're gonna reach out to the family. And almost always there are surviving siblings. I remember in one occasion, we're in the high school principal's office and there's a big crowd of the administrators and counselors in the office. And there's this great debate going on with about half the room saying, oh, I think she probably just fell asleep in the garage at 3 a.m. in the morning listening to the radio and the carbon monoxide death was an accident. But the other half of the room was saying, I don't think it could have been an accident, probably on purpose. So what did I say to the principal? Let's go to the home. Do you wanna drive or do you want me to drive? And when we arrived at the home, we were welcomed. Pretty quickly, we were told, yes, it was a suicide. 
And the parents are like, Dr. Pullman, you've got to help our surviving daughter. She's one year younger. She goes to the same high school. Then I even had the occasion over the next few hours and the next couple of days to talk with them about the timing of the funeral. If the funeral is in the evening or on Saturday, then large numbers of parents will accompany their children to the funeral. And that's really important. I had the opportunity to actually talk to the member of the clergy who was going to be conducting that service and hopefully getting some prevention messages shared and more about clergy and funerals for suicide victims in a few moments. So here's a call that I got just a year ago and I pretty much hear from somebody new every day from somewhere in the world about the problem of youth suicide. And yesterday I was consulting with a, an international school in Brazil about the anniversaries coming up because I helped them a year ago. And I'm expecting a call from another school in a different part of Brazil that just experienced a suicide. And I always want to do anything I can to volunteer, to consult, and try to help schools. But here was one from Florida. Well, we've had our second suicide. The second suicide victim shot himself in the school bathroom. And the social worker is saying the principal's idea is she wants all 2,700 students to hold hands and circle the building sort of in a kumbaya moment. And what do you think about that? Well, something I know is that every school has at least some students that are disillusioned. They're not that connected. And now that I mentioned the word connection, you know, the Center for Disease Control pretty much says everything about suicide prevention is connection. And there was a famous sociologist named Durkheim a hundred years ago who said this, when somebody dies by suicide, we need to realize we all failed. They weren't connected to the school, the workplace, the community, we all failed. So increasing connections is incredibly important so that every student feels that connections to school. So I was trying to tactfully suggest, you know, maybe this isn't the best idea to have everybody hold hands. Let's talk about some other things. And by the way, I believe strongly that we got to talk to kids about suicide prevention, but we need to do it in a group size no larger than a classroom. And why is that so important? Well, in an assembly, kids probably aren't going to ask you a question. And in assembly, you can't get a read on how they're experiencing this particular topic. And somebody with dark hair was crying uncontrollably, and they went out the back door to the auditorium, and we don't even know who they are. So I was talking about something you're going to hear a lot about in these two webinars about how do we have a conversation with students about this. And then I thought things were going pretty well, but I got a call back the next day. And they said, you know, a world champion wrestler heard about our two suicides and he normally charges thousands of dollars for his assembly on Be a Champion. He's offering to come to our school and do that presentation free. Can you immediately think of the question I had? What does a world champion wrestler know about suicide postvention? I think you need to be getting social workers and counselors and psychologists involved, not having a world champion wrestler. And I remember going to Maryville, Missouri years ago. They had a youth suicide point cluster and I did a lot of work there. And then after I'd come home, they called and said, well, Kurt Cobain dance going to come and she's going to do a prevention presentation. Well, I pretty much asked the same question was, I know she lost her nephew to suicide, but does she have credentials? Did she go back to school and get a mental health degree? What's she going to say? And then they were talking about gathering the students from seven other small high schools all together for one presentation. And I was trying to talk them out of that. But one thing I've learned as a consultant, 
when you don't tell somebody what they want to hear, they maybe don't call you back. So in both of those situations, I don't think the schools took my advice. And I'm going to, at some point, get to the slide that is going to show you what I believe is the single best source of information for you in the aftermath of a youth suicide. This was a call from a high school principal in St. Louis. And yes, she was on the girls' soccer team and she died by suicide. And please note today that I am never going to put the word committed with our topic today. I'm always going to say died by suicide. That is so much more acceptable to survivors. And it seems to imply even a 13-year-old kid traveled a long road. We could argue it's everyone's fault, yet it's no one's fault. But if you told me my dad committed something, I might tell you, you commit a crime, you commit a burglary. And by the way, who really drives suicide prevention in this country? Driven by survivors. Because we don't want to give up. We don't want this to happen to someone else's loved one. So when the principal said, well, I think the only kids affected are on the school soccer team. Well, I gathered a little more information and I said, I understand she played on one of those travel soccer teams. There were kids from nine other St. Louis high schools on that team. This is not going to affect just your high school. In fact, maybe in the chat box, somebody could answer this because I'm going to argue the impact of a youth suicide today in 2024 is greater than ever before. But the question is really why? Why do I believe that impact is greater than ever before? This was a principal from Wisconsin. Okay? He says to me, well, the parents of the suicide victim wanted a scholarship in her memory. And I told them, absolutely not. We're not going to be glorifying your daughter's death. So all they want is the scholarship in memory of their daughter. I think that would be appropriate. First question is, of course, what have you done before? Do you have scholarships in memory of other children who have died? Well, yes. Then we finally got down to what was his real concern? I'm going to have to hand him a microphone and they're going to tell us a long, sad story. Well, my response was, just thank them for the scholarship. You don't have to hand them a microphone. And I remember doing a keynote in Idaho. And I was a little nervous when they said, well, a mom who lost her middle schooler last year, she's going to present before you. And I was worried that maybe we were all going to hear a long, very tragic story. But here's all she did. She showed us a picture of her son. She said, he died by suicide nine months ago. I remember the exact time, the exact day of the week. And then she said, here's this picture. I just wanted to put a personal face on the importance of this presentation today. So yes, she shared her tragedy, but she didn't dwell on it. She just said, this is important. And I thought she set a pretty nice tone. So Sally, I wanna wait and get some responses on this. If a student dies by suicide, the response of the school should be different than if the student died from other causes, i.e. a car accident, a drowning, they died of cancer. Let's just take a moment and tell me if we're getting some answers. Do we do it differently? Do we have any responses and do we have anything in the chat box that I need to address at this time?
Well, I'll go ahead and answer the question for you. As I would like to say, um, there are lots of people commenting on the impact of social media on suicide. Okay. And then the question you just asked, um, that there are lots of, uh, often there are lots of schools that are impacted by a suicide. And, um, oh, people avoid it because they don't want to open a can of worms as a comment. Okay, that's a, those are so many important points. And, you know, I, I now teach graduate psychology crisis intervention at a university, okay? Universities, for the most part, it's like we really don't want to know the cause of death. And the universities are large and, you know, the students aren't as connected, living in families nearby. But I think we always have to do our best to find out the cause of death. And I'm a big believer in telling people the truth about what's happened and providing them an opportunity to talk and ask questions. And a lot of our time is going to be spent on what messages is it appropriate for us to use? And the term in the literature is safe messages, which is like suicides can be prevented. There are evidence-based treatments for all forms of mental illness. But if I stay on this slide, the short answer is we should treat all deaths the same, regardless of the cause of death, regardless of popularity, and regardless of socioeconomics. So I'll give you an example locally. A Broward high school football star, the one with the Division I scholarship, his mom was losing her house, being foreclosed on. He stepped in front of a train. He died by suicide. They had his funeral at school. Three weeks later, a student at the same high school died by suicide. No funeral at school for her. So perhaps the smartest piece of advice I could give you, and it'll be on a slide in a moment, is encourage your school district to develop a memorialization policy. Form a committee. Look at what's been done before. Make specific plans for what will be done from this point in the future. And whatever is decided should be district-wide, not up to an individual principal. And so what's my favorite way to memorialize a suicide victim? It's through what is called living memorials, which is raising money for suicide prevention, raising the awareness of the suicide warning signs. And as I'm looking out the window, I can see the site where every fall we host the out of darkness walk on campus for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And last year, we raised $75,000 here. And I was honored to get to do the welcome. Families and friends are out there walking and raising money for suicide prevention. That's my favorite way to memorialize a suicide victim. And I'm hoping, Sally, that they'll put some comments in the chat box about this, whether you've experienced a postvention response that didn't go particularly well. And here's a general comment that I like to make. Every school has crises that occur over the course of the year. And what I think is missing is we need to sit around the table with that school crisis team, law enforcement, mental health professionals, administrators, teachers, and we need to talk about what happened this year. How did our response go? What did we learn? What do we need to do differently? Do we need to increase some safety efforts? We need to survey students and get more information from them about their needs for mental health and connections and safety and primary prevention. What are we doing to prevent something like that from ever happening in the future? 
And having worked full time in schools for 25 years and talking to school personnel virtually every day, somehow not every school has those meetings where they really talk about what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to do differently? And I have a postvention response that didn't go so well back when I was working in the suburban Houston school district. The principal didn't call for any help. There's sometimes principals that don't believe they need any help. And by the way, if we have a principal or an assistant principal on this webinar today, I would like to personally give you a high five and a thank you because I'm gonna make a prediction that our audience is largely only school mental health professionals. But if you're an administrator, put it in the chat box and I wanna thank you personally because your involvement in postvention is incredibly important. So the middle school principal didn't call for any help. I went anyway. As Soon as I heard there'd been a suicide, I drove over and I walked into the principal's office and tried to offer my help. And he said, well, I already made an announcement, Scott. I'm like, okay, Bill, what did you announce? Well, I told all the middle school students that if you want more information about Larry's death, come on down to the cafeteria. And I'm like, Bill, because he went on to tell me he was going to tell the students it was a suicide, he shot himself. Bill, I really think it'd be best if you kept all the students in their classrooms and let us go around with school counseling and mental health staff and we'll cover every classroom, we'll let students know what happened and we'll most importantly hear from them. He's like, no, I can do it, he said. I'm just gonna have them all come down to the cafeteria. Well, hundreds and hundreds of students came to the cafeteria. When he told them that Larry shot himself, that it was a suicide, things got pretty much out of control. And right away, there was a lot of students saying it was her fault. His eighth grade girlfriend told him she was pregnant. I understand she wasn't even pregnant. You know, we had to call for school security and we basically had to take her out a back door. And it took us hours to get control of that school. And teachers were going up to students wanting to help them. And the students were basically flipping them the bird. I mean, students ended up being disciplined, totally out of control. And please know, nobody ever said do nothing after a youth suicide. They always said help everybody with their shock, their grief, their confusion, and yes, sometimes there's even guilt. But they never said do nothing. And an article decades ago gave the impression to school principals that you just do nothing. So that is not correct. I understand we've had debate about whether there should be a bench in front of a school, whether we should plant a tree, all of those things. There has been some debate, and we'll talk about that more. But everybody always said, reach out and help all concerned with their emotions. And one of the things I've learned through 40 years of this Help the adults first. Tell the adults first. Give the adults a chance to talk about what's on their mind. Help them understand the typical reactions that kids have to a traumatic event. They regress academically, behaviorally. They have nightmares, worries, sleeping problems about the future. And worries about the future and sleeping problems. That's not the unusual. That's a pretty much every kid as one or more of those. And so by helping the parents and helping the school staff and encouraging them to be patient, tolerant, structured, loving, and particularly be listening. And I, I presented yesterday and I use you know, this phrase that as an adult, I almost never use. I don't tell students I understand. Can I really understand? Maybe 
if I lost a classmate to suicide when I was 15, but help me to understand. I can't imagine everything that you're going through. Primarily, we need to listen. All right. So Sally, did anybody share anything about any postvention responses? Um, yeah, there were a, a couple of good questions that have come up in, in our trainings before too, is what if parents don't want you to um, say that it was a suicide, that just it was a death, and then the team can't really discuss suicide or treat it that way? And the other one is the difficulty when facts and rumors spread throughout the school through social media before the school can respond. Okay. Great question. We'll take the second one first. So before all of our technology, I mean, the schools had some time, right? They had some hours. Maybe they could make the plan tonight and they would be clarifying what they're going to do and what they're say tomorrow, going to say tomorrow. But now, like the quicker we can verify things, the better. And here's the phrase that I've had to use many times. It's really hard not to know what happened. We do know that he died. You've lost a classmate. You've lost a friend. I'm sure we'll have more information soon. But right now, let's just focus on the fact that your classmate or your friend died. Meanwhile, we're trying to do our best. So I have found parents the most cooperative when we go in person to their home. And I say things like this. Well, first of all, I express my sorrow at the loss of their child. And then I say, you know, it would really be helpful if we could simply acknowledge the cause of death. Please know, we're never going to theorize about why your child did what he did, but we're always very concerned about additional suicides. And the more that we can talk about everybody's important role in suicide prevention, what to look for and what to do. Of course, now, at some point, we're going to talk very specifically about the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention After a Suicide Toolkit for Schools. I helped write it in 2011. I helped revise it in 2018. I believe it is the best 50 pages that have ever been written about postvention in schools. And I had the chance last week, I spoke in Gainesville and I had hundreds of school mental health professionals. And I said, raise your hand if you've ever looked at the After a Suicide Toolkit for Schools. Four hands went up. So unfortunately, we need to really increase the awareness of that toolkit. And I'm going to talk a lot more about it. But in particular, Sally, there is a sample letter to address the first question you asked. There are actually several sample letters. And schools can choose the one that fits their situation, and they're very free to modify it. But one of those sample letters goes like this. The parents have asked that the cause of death of their child not be disclosed, and we do want to want, honor their wishes. However, it's really important that we talk about the leading causes of death for children, and those are accidents, suicide, and homicide. And let's talk about everybody's important role in preventing those deaths. So it gives you the opportunity to at least talk about suicide prevention. But I remember a school board president in Atlanta saying, well, we would never send out that letter. Well, that will be up to you. But I think it's important that the members of the school crisis team be familiar with the toolkit and that they review with the crisis team those sample letters and decide what information they are going to share. And I repeat again, I've had very good luck in person talking to the family. Here's one more example, a postvention example that prevented a bit of a unique challenge. He was a seventh grade math teacher and he died by suicide. Now, he was one of those guys that spent a career in business. 
And now he's suddenly going to be teaching seventh grade. And the math team felt really badly. They knew that he was struggling a lot and particularly not handling student discipline issues well. And they were all feeling like ah, we should have somehow done more to have eased his transition from business into teaching middle schoolers. So we're working on the letter that's gonna go out to his 135 students' parents. And we're reviewing it with the principal and the principal is all for telling the truth and doing everything we can to be able to, in classrooms, talk with students about his death. But then the superintendent weighed in. He says, you may not tell his students that he died by suicide, not unless you get the permission from his wife. So the principal and I drove to the widow's house we talked to her about, we really want to just be able to tell his students the truth. We want to encourage everyone to be more aware of crisis helplines and suicide warning signs. So she agreed. And so now we're in classrooms and several of the students said, we were so bad. That's my Mr. So-and-so killed himself just because we just were so badly behaved. And then I emphasized, traveled a long road. He was only here for the last few months of his life. There were many factors that went into his unfortunate decision to die by suicide. No, it is not your fault. Please know that your classroom behavior had no major role in this particular decision. So now we're handing the students the letters to go home to their parents. And I see a student walking over to the trash can and he's going to drop the letter in the trash can. So I just stepped in front of the trash can and told him, please take the letter home so your parents do in fact know what happened. Now, he walked out of the room. He might've dropped it in a trash can down the hall, but I wasn't going to basically indicate that it was okay with me that he was not taking that letter home. But anybody else have anything about a postvention experience that we should address at this time, Sally? So Dr. Polo, we did want to let you know and let the um, participants know that we did put a link to the toolkit in the chat as well. Please. And another um, comment that did come up was, um, talking about um, if you've had any experiences with other parents, not the parents of, of the um, student that died by suicide, but other parents that don't want social emotional, you know, um, learning type things shared. They don't, they don't want those discussions within the school and whether you've had experience with that and how you would handle that. And Sally, you do know where I reside, right? So this is sort of ground zero in our state for concern about the very topics that you brought up. State of Florida is now focusing on, it's not social emotional learning, it's all about resiliency. And resiliency is important. What are the keys to being resilient? Being surrounded by loving and caring family and friends having the opportunity to vent strong emotions, having problem-solving skills, as well as being optimistic about the future. And sometimes I think it's like school leaders, counselors, social workers, administrators, we've been at this a long time and we know what is the best for students in these really sensitive situations. And so obviously I am saying, I believe we help kids the most by telling the truth. I don't see that we have to contact every family before we share what, what is often common knowledge. In a small town, it's front page news. I mean, it's talked about in our community. 
And I know that we're never going to please every single parent. And I'm happy to take the phone calls from the parents that, you know, why did you tell my child this information? Well, it was important. It gave them an opportunity to be heard. We talked about how important everybody's role is in prevention. But I'm recognizing this is a challenging time. And this is an issue in some of our states more than others about what do we need parent permission for? But almost always, the whole school was buzzing with something. And the sooner that we can share the facts, we can stop all of the rumors by simply sharing the facts. So I already answered this question. My advice, but I want you to see the slide, develop a policy. And with that policy, you're going to have a plan for going forward, not for an individual school, but for all the schools in the district. What is the single greatest resource? Thank you for putting in the chat box, the After Suicide Toolkit for Schools. Many of us who've devoted our careers to youth suicide prevention developed that toolkit. And there it is. So let's look at who put it out. Suicide Prevention Resource Center, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So here's the bottom line. I do not believe a school can be criticized for following that toolkit. I believe a school can be criticized for not following it. And the toolkit isn't going to say, oh, you got to get all the parents' permission before you tell their children that, you know, their classmate or a staff member died by suicide. So, I recommend following the recommendations in this toolkit. Printing it out, having it available, sharing it with the administration, hopefully doing that in advance. We already heard from Jay that suicide is the second leading cause of death for anybody over 10 in the state of Nebraska, okay? So that means schools need to be prepared for this. And having the toolkit, printing it out, reviewing it, talking about it in a team meeting, instead of just trying to find it, you know, in a few minutes after you got the call that a suicide death had occurred. All right, this one takes us to the media. And ironically, in my class, I just sent them their homework assignment before class next Monday. They are to read a Newsweek magazine article about suicide contagion at Academy 20 High School in Colorado Springs. That article violated all the known media guidelines. It referred to the plague in the hallway. It gave very explicit details about how the five young people who died in the spring semester who attended the same high school died by suicide. Newsweek even threw in information about the choking game in case kids didn't know what the choking game was all about. It described in detail a young lady who, when she was hanging herself, texted her friends saying, I have hung myself. And her friends texted back, see if you can unhang. Nobody called 911. Nobody called her parents. I mean, that is an example in a national news magazine that violated. These media guidelines have been out there for decades. Here's one more. Springfield, Missouri, not really a big place. So what did the headline in the Springfield, Missouri newspaper say? Popular Ozark student falls to dark and lonely thoughts. Front page story above the fold, there's a picture. It described she picked her favorite dress up at the cleaners. It was black. She put it on 
She drove to the Holodome in Springfield, Missouri. She dropped her cyanide tablet into the Coke, drank it in the hotel restaurant and fell dead to the floor. Then the final sentence in the article, she was just too sensitive for this tough world. We don't want to give any kid the message that they're too sensitive for this world. So that pretty much violated all of the known media guidelines. So where could you find those guidelines? Because I printed out a hard copy for my students for next Monday, reportingonsuicide.org. Suicide Awareness Voices and Education, save.org. And now I made myself some notes today. 13 reasons why. When that came out, it was the most popular Netflix program in history. If you watched it, you know it was all about the suicide of a high school teenager who mailed 13 revenge tapes to the 13 individuals she was blaming for her impending suicide. So suicide isn't about revenge. Suicide isn't even about other people. Suicide is about ending what you perceive as unendurable pain. It's about tunnel vision. It's about constriction. Now, I suffered through all four seasons of 13 Reasons Why. And you know what maybe bothered me the most? Only one time in four seasons was an adult seen as somebody you go to for help. One time. It was like those adolescents were leading secret lives and it had to do with sex, drugs, violence, reckless behavior. Hannah, who was the suicide victim, finally went to the school counselor. If you saw this scene, you would never forget it. She's sitting in the school counselor's office. She's clearly depressed. She's crying. She tells the school counselor, she got raped. You know what he zeroed in on? Who raped you, Hannah? He's not focusing on everything she's gone through. He's demanding to know who raped her. Well, she won't tell him other than to say he was a senior. Then Counselor Porter says, oh, good. He'll be gone in a couple of months. So the counselor doesn't call law enforcement. The counselor doesn't help Hannah. The counselor does not contact her parents. Frustrating. School counselors all across the country should have picketed the Netflix headquarters in Los Angeles. And then since I know Jay is on, Jay, seasons three and four dealt with a school shooting. Tyler, who was a student at the school, in a brutal scene, was sodomized in the high school restroom, and somehow no adults are aware of that at all. So Tyler's quite angry. Tyler gets an assault weapon, and his friends are worried about him, but they don't get adults involved. They say things like, well, you watch Tyler tonight and stay with him. I'll stay with him tomorrow. Now, Tyler's decided to take his assault weapon to the school dance. Somehow, Clay figures it out. Clay is a 16-year-old kid. He doesn't call law enforcement. He doesn't dial 911. He calls Tony, another kid. And the two of them manage to just barely stop Tyler before he arrives at the school dance with his assault weapon. So can you see all the dangerous messages that were in that particular program? I mean, I can go on and on. I did an hour-long webinar of the dangers of that program. So the media does not help us. And so what can we do? Well, you're a school counselor. You could use, hopefully, you have a public information officer, and you could talk with them and share with them the media guidelines for reporting so they could work with the local radio, television, and newspaper. 
Maybe you don't even have a public information officer. Well, with your principal's blessing, you could share information with the local media about reporting and following those guidelines. Now, here's one of my favorite examples. The media wanted to do a story on suicides that we'd had where I previously worked. And so it was a big district. I was actually there 24 years. 42 kids died by suicide. You know, I think I'm the only one that kept track. Nobody else wanted to acknowledge that. And I'm not talking about a kid who graduated or moved nearby to a different suburban school district. No, I'm talking about the kids that didn't show up today because they died by suicide yesterday. So I got a lot of experience in postvention. But you know, the most obvious question that you must be thinking, 42 students where I used to work died by suicide. How many of them did we actually have a chance to work with, to screen, to develop a safety plan, to refer them for community-based services? The answer was one. The other 41, we had no information whatsoever. Now, we learned pretty quickly that their friends knew all about their suicidal thoughts and plans, but unfortunately, the friends did not go to a trusted adult. So my favorite example, the media wanted to do a story in the aftermath of a suicide. And I said, let's wait. Could we put the story off for a month? And what I'd really like you to do, either immediately or next month, is let's do a story on prevention. Let me uh, let you talk to somebody who basically changed their mind, got the help they needed. Let's do a story about somebody who did not attempt and die by suicide. So trying to move them in the direction of prevention instead of all the stories about postvention. So I mentioned that I'm a survivor of suicide, right? What helps us the most? And just yesterday, somebody came into my office. 81-year-old dad died by suicide. Obviously, my colleague is devastated, but we had a chance to talk about things like this. It was their choice. It was a very unfortunate choice, but it was not something that you ever wish for them. And then it was like, how could he do this to the family? Well, he wasn't thinking about the family. He was wanting to end what he perceived as unendurable pain. And suicide rates are actually the highest in America for old white men like me, if they have family health and financial problems and guns. You know, you rarely survive a suicide attempt with a gun. Guns are only used in 5% of suicide attempts in our country, yet they result in 55% of suicide deaths. So I'm not here today to question any adult's right to own a gun. I'm simply going to say, with that right comes a responsibility to secure that gun from a troubled, angry, depressed, substance abusing, mentally ill person who might reside in your very own home. Okay, Iowa wasn't very far away, right? Where the young man killed a student and sadly the principal also died. Have you read a single thing, any information about zeroing in on where did you get the gun? Because with school shootings, over 80% of the time, the guns came from their homes. And I'm just saying, guns need to be secured in our homes. I just read a story locally in the paper. The Florida legislature is looking at maybe high school kids should be allowed to own guns. I mean, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, it's like, where is the responsibility about this? And then we can all follow the mom in Oxford, Michigan. She's on trial right now. 
And that will be a very interesting case to determine are parents going to be held responsible for not securing the guns in their home when somebody takes the gun and dies by suicide or shoots somebody at school? These are questions that our society has really been wrestling with. And I've testified in front of Congress now four times about school violence and youth suicide prevention. And 25 years ago, I made a simple statement about securing guns in our homes. Adults need to be responsible enough to do that. So back to what really is on this slide. I went to a general grief group after the suicide of my dad. And, you know, you're sitting around a table with people and somebody lost their twin brother in a car accident. Somebody's mom died by cancer. And then I go, my dad shot himself. Can you see how I immediately felt that I was not in the right place? So where do families that have lost loved ones to suicide get the most help? When they go to a suicide survivor loss group. Everybody there lost a loved one to suicide. And I know that suicide survivor loss groups are in every major city. The last time I was in Omaha after a suicide cluster, I mean, I was incredibly impressed with the suicide survivor loss group. You know what they said to me? Well, when we're aware that a, another family lost an adolescent to suicide, we just drive to the house. We knock on the door. And we share that we lost our child to suicide too. Can we come in? Can we talk with you? I actually attended one of their meetings and I was incredibly impressed with how the group coalesced and supported each other. And there are online suicide survivor groups also because a great challenge for getting the help you need is when you live in a rural area. And I've had multiple projects with the state of Montana by the way, here's something that I would like to ask everybody. Sally, let's have them put in the chat box. You tell me what states have the biggest problem with suicide in our country. We'll come back to that in a moment. But answer, what states do you think have the biggest problem? Okay. So suicide survivor groups, that's where people really get the help they need. And many times, they get active with raising money and raising awareness for suicide prevention. So I just took a call about this slide, the anniversary of the death by suicide of the high school senior is coming up. Okay. So first of all, I complimented them for reaching out to me. And pretty quickly we realized that well, most of the kids that were really affected, they graduated. They're not at the school right now. They're working or they've gone on to college, for example. Well, then I asked the really obvious question, because um, I'm remembering, didn't she have a surviving sibling at the school? Oh, but he no longer attends our school. Well, I encouraged the counselor to reach out to the family to check on the surviving sibling, to reach out to the new school that he's attending. And then I suggested that what we really need to do is just take our cue from the students. Are they saying in class they need to do something? Are students coming into the counseling office and asking what's going to be done on the anniversary of the suicide? And I do know there's often an anniversary effect to suicide. So what do I mean by that? Somebody attempts or dies by suicide on the birthday their friend would have had or on the anniversary of the tragedy. So my main recommendation was this. Identify those kids still at the school that had a very strong connection to the deceased. I'm not talking about an announcement over the PA system. I'm talking about making a list and reaching out in advance. Although some school counselors once said to me, oh, Scott, you know, if we make them aware of the anniversary, they're gonna like get upset. 
really? You think they don't know that the anniversary of their best friend's death is coming up next Tuesday? You think she doesn't know that next Tuesday is the anniversary of her older brother's suicide? I mean, they know that. It's a difficult day. Reach out in advance to them. So Sally, did we get any answers about what states have the highest suicide rates? Um, yes, big numbers. People thought um, Alaska, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, North and South Dakota, New York. Those were probably the highest number that people said. Okay, well. They're also, Dr. Pullen, they're also mentioning um, states that have uh, a lot of guns, a lot of handguns that are available, uh, poverty, and just really isolated. Kind of the middle America is what they're kind of talking about. Okay, so a really smart group, and I'm really glad they mentioned New York. So Kim and Sally, I was in New York City recently. Those people are not suicidal in New York City. They are homicidal. Okay. That was my attempt at a little humor today. So it is all of the Western states. It is always Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, Washington, Idaho. In fact, Colorado. It is every Western state except California. So what are the reasons? There are multiple reasons. Rural nature, isolation in some of those states, seasonal affective disorder, availability of guns, high percentage of Native Americans. Then there's even the elevation theory that if you live at five or 6,000 feet above sea level, you may not be getting enough oxygen. And if you're on an antidepressant, it probably doesn't work as well as it would at sea level. I mean, I'm sitting here right now, literally 10 feet above sea level. I mean, we're worried that South Florida will like flood someday. But at the simplest level, the fewest suicides and the lowest suicide rates, and they're always given per 100,000 people in a particular age group. The lowest rates are all in the East. The highest rates are all in the West. And gun availability is a very major factor. Nebraska actually ranks 35th. So where could you find this data if you wanted it? Go to save.org, okay? Have schools been sued for failing to implement best practice postvention procedures? The answer is yes. And it's a district not too far away from you. I think it's the only one ever. The Shawnee Mission School District, a suburb of Kansas City was sued. And we'll talk about that at great length. So please answer this one. Are adolescents more susceptible to the imitation of suicide than other age groups? Let's see if we can get a response to that one. So one question, have you ever read about a suicide cluster at like a retirement center? Because I never have. Adolescents are the most susceptible to imitating suicidal behavior. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about this in a few minutes. So. And the responses overwhelmingly are yes to that. Yes. And I think they already answered this one because they talked about social media. So the impact of a student's suicide is greater than ever before. Vulnerable young people actually find each other online. And when something traumatic happens, it doesn't affect one school or one community. It's essentially broadcast. It's literally like social 
media is actually transcending physical proximity in terms of spreading the word about a suicide. And sadly, there's still websites that encourage suicide, that give specific directions about how somebody could use something to die by suicide. So, and we could talk about this for hours, but I hope everybody is aware that the Surgeon General put out two advisories. The first one was two years ago. Protecting the mental health of our youth, seizing the moment, made recommendations for schools, communities, care parents, and the students themselves. Then he put out a second advisory, basically saying social media is dramatically impacting the mental health of our youth. And I can summarize that advisory with really this one sentence. Social media is making our young people feel like they're not smart enough, they're not rich enough, and they're not good enough. And we could do an entire webinar on this, but at the simplest level, I want parents to pay more attention to technology, screen time, and social media. And I like to ask students themselves a simple question. Have you ever missed out on something you really wanted to do because of all the screen time? And suicide and sleep deprivation are strongly connected. And the bottom line is that many teenagers go to bed with all the technology under the pillow and they're awakened in the middle of the night. There are actually studies that say 25% of all teenage girls purposely wake up in the middle of the night to check to see what might have been posted about them. So what I wish parents would do, just simply say to their children, hand me your phone, it's time to go to bed now. Hand me your iPad. Your iPad, your computer, your phone will all be charged and ready to go for you in the morning. But right now, you need to get a good night's sleep. And then I'm going to throw out one idea. And I hope somebody will put an answer in the chat box. So here it is. We have parent-teacher conferences all across America every October, right? So let's say Sally is the parent coming in and I am the second grade teacher. And I just went over her child's behavior and academics. And then I gently say something like this. Sally, would you mind talking about the amount of screen time your second grader spends each day? Now, maybe Sally turns to me and says, none of your business. But I think most parents would say, you know, I'm kind of worried about that. He's only seven. Uh, what, what amount of time is reasonable? And I could respond by sharing with you, Sally, here are the recommendation from the American Medical Association. So just the idea of bringing this up. And then we have an a meeting on academics and the, the plan for graduation. Well, maybe an OIT person could take five or 10 minutes and talk a little bit about technology and things parents could look out for. 